I just see it uh, as a beginning. Uh, not just this flight, but in this program, which has really been a very short piece of human history. It's quite a traumatic ordeal to be propelled into space. As you accelerate up to 25 times the speed of sound, a significant amount of energy is used. You are fully aware that you are entering a different world. Therefore, the moment the engines shut off and you enter weightlessness, it is a completely serene feeling. Similar to how there is great clarity in space due to the absence of atmospheric haze. It's challenging to judge distances because you can see so far. The first thing photons of light from the sun strike in the famous photograph of Aldrin on the moon is his suit. You can plainly see the flag, the lunar lander and Armstrong taking the picture if you look through his visor. No haze or dust exists. Since there is no light scattering as a result, the shadow is clear and distinct. This is what gave rise to numerous ideas of ulterior motives by the government. Did we really go to the moon? Before he passed away, what information did Neil Armstrong share regarding the Apollo space missions? Why didn't we return to the moon? Join us as we explore the information the late Apollo astronaut revealed about the moon before his death. When viewed from space, the uniqueness of Earth immediately stands out. You can tell there's life on our planet from hundreds of thousands of miles away. It stands out as stunningly gorgeous and delicate against the inky depths. The moon is one of the few celestial bodies that can be seen with the naked eye because of its proximity to Earth. For as long as we've been a thinking species, it's fascinated us. Even after thousands of years of study, we still don't know everything there is to know about it. Similar to Earth, the Moon has been subjected to a constant barrage of asteroid and meteorite collisions since its formation out of a collection of space debris 4.5 billion years ago. However, unlike Earth, which can constantly renew itself through processes like erosion, plate tectonics, and volcanism, the Moon has no such mechanisms to repair its many impact sites. Its surface is covered in craters that date back billions of years, relics of a violent history that has been essentially frozen in time. Parts of that history may be mapped with certainty, while others remain a mystery. The moon has been used as a timepiece, venerated as a goddess by a wide range of cultures, and even considered a prophetic object at certain points in human history. However, there are still several really puzzling craters cut deeply into the surface of the moon that we have yet to explain after millennia of human analysis, centuries of astronomical observations, and six crude lunar visits. There are still many mysteries surrounding the moon, despite the fact that it has silently observed Earth for billions of years. We have few solid answers concerning its origins, history, and especially its murky underbelly. What secrets do you think lie within this unseen half of the planet? First of all, despite being commonly associated with Pink Floyd's seminal record, Dark Side of the Moon is actually misleading. The other half of the moon is called the Far Side of the Moon by scientists, despite the fact that it is no darker than the side we can see. It still receives ample sunlight, just like the close side. In fact, when the moon is young on Earth, Observers on the opposite side of the solar system will see a full moon since the entire hemisphere will be bathed in sunlight. But in a more general sense, it is still night. Because of the challenges involved in visiting, it remains largely undiscovered and shrouded in mystery. The Soviet Luna 3 probe took the first photographs of the moon's far side in 1959, but even now the images are distorted and difficult to interpret. It wasn't until Apollo 8 over a decade later that humans got to see it for themselves, and even now, only a select few people have had the opportunity. First impression of the moon's dark side was that it was far more cratered than the moon's bright side. There are many craters on the moon's near side, but there are also large gray areas known as Lunar Maria, or Mare. These regions are so distinct that they can be seen by the naked eye on a moonlit night and they were given their names by the Romans, who had the same view as we do now, thousands of years ago. Mare comes from the Latin word for sea, from which we also derive maritime and other related terms. 
These drab stretches of water were taken for real at one point. The Maria are vast fields of ancient lava, some of which date back billions of years to the birth of the Earth-Moon system. So in a way, this is true. The near side of the moon was heated by the still scorching Earth as it was forming. This caused the crust on the far side to be thicker, while more aluminum and calcium condensed in the atmosphere on the near side due to the temperature difference. Impact craters are less common on the near side because of this. It's not that asteroids rarely hit the near side, it's just that the volcanic activity on the near side has filled up the craters. Because the far side has a thicker, less flexible crust, we can see impact craters that formed billions of years ago. Despite Maria's advanced age, the moon, like Earth, is subject to a steady onslaught of meteors. While the vast majority of meteors are rather harmless, significant impact events are always possible. However, there is a widely held belief that the dark side of the moon has nothing to do with its abundance of impact craters. Some have speculated that alien spies can most safely observe Earth from the moon's dark side. If aliens were residing on the moon and emitting radio signals, humans wouldn't be able to pick them up because the moon itself blocks radio frequencies. Given the lunar environment, any intelligent life there would have to be highly developed to make use of radio waves to communicate. Because of the moon's tidal locking mechanism, it is also completely undetectable to those on Earth. Seeing the moon's far side from Earth would require extremely sophisticated technology. One characteristic that makes it hard for us to find extraterrestrial life on the moon is also likely to make it hard for them to spy on us. Therefore, it wouldn't make for a particularly good home base. Despite this, conspiracy theorists have persisted in searching for unnatural features in photographs of the moon's dark side, claiming variously that castles and other buildings can be seen on the lunar surface. Did Neil Armstrong really see aliens on the moon? Or is the whole story made up? During his moonwalk, Armstrong reportedly switched from transmitting on a television accessible frequency to a medical frequency accessible only to mission control, giving credence to the rumor. This actually occurs, but it is anyone's guess what he said. If there was an unknown object following their journey to the moon, Buzz Aldrin has confirmed it. The astronauts wondered if it was part of their rocket to mission control, but they never said, while we're in space, something is following the path we took to get here. It may have come from any of the many satellites or other objects that had been launched to the moon. Although Armstrong never mentioned the incident, he also never called Aldrin's account of the encounter into question. To add insult to injury, when asked in an interview why he switched to his medical frequency, Armstrong said, I have no comment on that, and I'm uncomfortable discussing the topic in further detail. In short, we don't know, and it's rather arrogant to say there must be nothing when the astronauts walked around in something the size of a large backyard. However, proof must be extraordinary to support extraordinary claims. Aliens, if they exist, and it would be pretentious of us to presume either way, might visit because of the abundance of helium-3. Since there is no oxygen-containing atmosphere on the moon, helium-3 is abundant there. As a huge potential energy source, helium-3 is being considered as a fuel for nuclear fusion reactors. It's possible that aliens, if they exist, use a fusion reactor to power their interstellar travels. There must be a good reason why aliens, if they exist, have not come forward. When asked about the moon landing, why did Neil Armstrong seem so uneasy during interviews? Neil Armstrong was an extremely reclusive individual. He didn't stay in the public eye for long once his flight was over. He wanted no part of the spotlight. Throughout his life, Armstrong did give interviews and public speeches, but he clearly didn't enjoy doing so. But he also did a lot of writing, participated in a number of boards and committees, and lectured at universities. There has never been any evidence that Armstrong had anything to hide regarding his career in aviation and space exploration. Just like many other people, he was protective of his own space. Let me ask you this, how confident are you in front of a large, loud audience under strong lights? Many folks can't keep going because the tension is too much. It was clear that some of the Apollo astronauts were born to it. Buzz Aldrin is one among those who mastered the skill. The likes of Neil Armstrong simply couldn't take it. 
The vast majority of them simply disappeared from public consciousness. Armstrong couldn't even consider doing it. Exactly what did Neil Armstrong say when he landed on the moon? One of the two most famous comments about human spaceflight is a misquote, and the other was accidentally quoted. Armstrong misspoke when he said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, after stepping off the lunar module's ladder onto the moon's surface during Apollo 11. He should have said, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The introductory article A clarifies the meaning of the line, which compares the monumental achievement of sending a human being to the moon to the relatively insignificant feat of a single person climbing down one step of a ladder. However, under the intense pressure of the moment, he omitted that crucial detail. The word was supposedly covered by static, according to NASA. We might never know, of course. However, one of the most well-known statements ever leaves off an essential word. But why did we give up on the moon in the 1970s and never go back? The most obvious and reasonable explanation for why we haven't been to the moon since the early 1970s is that NASA's federal budget has been reduced, making it impossible for the agency to carry out costly and potentially risky space missions. At the time, the Apollo program alone cost $25.8 billion. Today, that amount is equivalent to about $260 billion after adjusting for inflation. Despite taking an early lead by launching the first satellite, the first man into space, and probes to the far side of the moon, and even Venus, the Soviet Union essentially gave up trying to compete after the United States won the space race. Engineer and visionary for the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev, passed away in the late 1960s. Since Korolev was no longer there to advocate for the space program, the Soviet government reduced financing, and the United States lost interest in its moon mission since it no longer had the incentive of Cold War competition. Despite widespread popular support for space travel, the Apollo missions were widely perceived as a financial black hole due to the lack of a viable return on investment. However, in 2017, the United States publicly stated its ambition to resume lunar exploration. This time, we hope to send a woman into space. The program may or may not be able to carry out its planned lunar trips by the mid-2020s. After all, there was a project in the 2000s named Constellation that aimed to return to the moon. Obama decided to scrap it in 2010 due to budget constraints. It was planning to land in 2020. Therefore, if it hadn't been canceled, we might have already transported people back to the moon by then. But if we already have the technology to get to the moon, because we accomplished it numerous times in the 1960s and 1970s, why are initiatives like Constellation and Artemis taking so long to prepare and costing so much money? Only eight years passed between the start of the Apollo program in 1961 and the first moon landing in 1969. Unfortunately, it appears that most of the information and expertise that allowed us to reach the moon in the 20th century has been lost. It's hard to believe that NASA wasn't able to save everything from the program after the massive funding cut that occurred in 1972. But that's the reality. The raw footage of the moon landing was taped over, and NASA has previously been criticized in the past for failing to preserve important materials. There is plenty of film of the moon landing that has survived thanks to the fact that it was shown live on television. However, what was lost was a raw, low frame rate feed that couldn't be used for airing. But it's not only the tapes. Virtually nothing else that contributed to the Apollo 11 moon landing has survived. We may have the plans and blueprints for rockets and lunar modules, but we lack the specialists who built the actual ship that landed humans on our nearest planetary neighbor. Numerous talented engineers, designers, and physicists, numbering in the hundreds of thousands, contributed to the initiative. We can't repeat the lunar landings in the 1960s without those same folks. Since the budget cuts forced the closure of facilities producing specialized parts for spaceflights, we can't even use the same construction materials. So, we don't know that either. Despite the abundance of literature and digital resources dedicated to lunar technology, we have lost the technology we formerly used since it was so incredibly complicated. While it's important to document as much as possible, 
There will inevitably be details that weren't captured on paper, yet were crucial to the mission's accomplishment, but have since been forgotten. That's why we can't just go back to the moon by recreating the lunar modules and the Saturn V rocket in their exact 1969 forms. Some have, however, made attempts to recreate it, most notably the massive F-1 engine used in the Saturn V rocket. At more than 360 feet in height, it was the tallest and mightiest rocket ever launched. In the 2010s, researchers attempted to revive an F-1 engine that hadn't flown since 1973 in the hopes of learning more about the engine's technology and using it to the creation of new rockets. A team of young NASA engineers labored painstakingly to rebuild the engine from scratch, using only what they could find in libraries, museums, and archives. The F-1 engine, while enormous, has a relatively straightforward design that could help NASA save money in the future of space exploration. Saturn V is one of the most well-known rockets ever built, and it played a crucial role in human space exploration. However, even with a Saturn V part, the mission was still incredibly challenging to complete. There are further problems with reusing Apollo hardware, and it's probably for the best that we don't. Large, one-time use rockets are counterproductive to modern concerns about sustainability and the environment, which has led to a current trend toward reusable vehicles. SpaceX's Falcon 9 is the industry standard for reusable rockets, although other businesses like Virgin and Blue Origin are developing their own reusable modules and parts. Similar efforts are being made by NASA, which also seeks recyclable materials for the Artemis spacecraft. With enough time, we can do what the Apollo program did and more. But better because we have greater technology now and have done substantially more research into space even without traveling onto the moon. Compared to Apollo, Artemis is expected to cost only $35 billion. While SpaceX will provide the majority of the mission's hardware, the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency will also provide a hand. As a result, it is supported by a substantial quantity of study and funding. We have gone so far that even if we still had access to Apollo's technology today, it would be obsolete. Sadly, the technology and people that helped us reach the moon no longer exist, but the truth is that no body of knowledge lasts forever. There is always a chance that something important will be forgotten, whether it be because it was destroyed or because its significance was overlooked at the time. The fact that it's difficult is the last piece of the puzzle explaining why we haven't returned to the moon already. Human spaceflight is one of humanity's most audacious and challenging scientific endeavors to date. NASA is the only space agency that has successfully sent humans to the moon, despite the proliferation of such organizations in recent decades. The second largest budgetary agency, the China National Space Administration, has not come any closer to achieving this goal. Even though 12 men set foot on the moon between 1969 and 1972, we currently lack a full understanding of how that was accomplished. This is why we are working on improved methods of returning to the lunar surface in the 2020s, which is exactly why we haven't been back to the moon yet. Do you believe there to be valid explanations for why we haven't revisited the moon since 1972? Or there are more secrets to this? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.